I welcome you to presentation number three in our series, uh, Retrieving Romans. This <clears throat> could also be called Re-Reading Romans. But our goal is to retrieve perspectives that have been lost. And the title today is Retrieving Ecology, Human and Otherwise. <clears throat> ecology, that's a big word these days. It actually refers to the science of relationships. So there is a human ecology and there is an expanded ecology that includes all the relationships we have. Relationships to other creatures, relationship to the earth. So retrieving ecology is not is not a small matter in relation to how biblical texts have been read, because we have in some ways contracted and shrunk the range of what these texts are actually up to or were up to originally. <clears throat> Let's <clears throat> review a couple of things here in our uh, quest to retrieve. <clears throat> so, Letter writing in ancient times was costly, risky, and time-consuming. So you didn't write that many letters because it was too big a project. You had to have a really compelling reason to do so. The letters are situational, <clears throat> grounded in specific time and place realities. Identifying the situation of Romans is the first task on the path to retrieval. That's how it would be with any letter, because situational, specific time, specific place. But it is especially important with Romans, because that letter has been read with disregard for the situation in which it arose, or with a high level of ignorance, how this, what sort of situation uh, it originated in. So, number four, among situations that might have led Paul to write to the Romans are the Spanish mission, mentions that, mediation between the weak and the strong, that is a topic in Romans, and the threat represented by counter-missionaries. And of these three candidates, there are others, but they are not as, as strong candidates, so I'm leaving them out. Of these three options, the only one that accounts for the most striking features in the letter is the threat of the counter-missionaries. And that helps us because that threat is a kind of ongoing thing. The letter assumes a problem. It also makes that problem explicit. But we need to have a sort of depth vision or we will not be able to read this letter uh, right and appreciate some of the nuances that will come up. <clears throat> so let me just say that what I'm doing now is introductory matters. <clears throat> what we're doing is, an ad is in theology, this kind of study, this kind of introduction is to read the text to do theology or the, the approach, my introduction to the letter is to reading Romans what anatomy is to read to studying medicine. We cannot study medicine without knowing anatomy, without knowing physiology, and we cannot read Romans competently unless we do an anatomy lesson first. So we are doing the anatomy lesson now, that's what I'm uh, aiming at. <clears throat> Sorry that it took me so many words to say that, but I have said it. <clears throat> so we have a writer, we have a letter, and we have recipients, we have a destination here, the letter is going to go to Rome. And <clears throat> Colosseum was built after Paul sent the letter, but uh, very shortly thereafter, and it is 
such an iconic landmark today. So, so now we are going to start at the end of the letter in chapter 16, the last chapter, and we are looking at the human ecology in Romans, the sort of uh, relationships, the web of relationships within which this letter originates. And here we are reading in Romans 16, verses 1 and 2, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at St. Crea, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints, and help her in whatever she may require from you. For she has been a benefactor of many, and of myself as well. So here is a woman, she, he calls her a sister, she is a deacon in the local church, and let's just uh, say that we should have a sort of caveat about church offices, because <clears throat> there were, that was not likely to be a hierarchical structure as we have today. So she is a significant person in the local faith community in St. Crea, the port city of Corinth. <clears throat> and then Paul says that they must welcome her and they must help her and that she has done a lot of good for many people and for me too. And what's the point of Phoebe? The point of Phoebe is that most people think, or many, many scholars think, and I am one of them, <clears throat> think that Phoebe is the courier for the letter to Romans. She is she here is in this illustration, there is a sort of handing over here in Corinth or in Shankreye, the scroll, the letter that Phoebe will carry to Rome. And this, of course, is quite, quite amazing that a woman in those days is entrusted with this task and was competent to execute it. You could have confidence in her. When she arrives in Rome, she will read the letter because that's how letters were handled in those days. The courier would read the letter. That's the transmission. So <clears throat> there is ecology here. There is relational, there are relational aspects that we need to, uh, <clears throat> to take seriously to, to help us uh, get into it and sort of get a feel for what is going on. <clears throat> we read on verses 3 to 5. Greet Prisca and Aquila, who work with me in Christ Jesus, and who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles, all the faith communities of the Gentiles. Greet also the church in their house. So here there is a, a couple, they are Jewish. So they are Jewish believers in Jesus, just like Paul, and they are workers with him. And from the book of Acts, we know that Paul worked as a self-supporting missionary. He was a tent maker. And sure enough, Prisca and Aquila were also tent makers and engaged in the same type of trade and self-supporting uh, ministry. So this is a close bond. These are the uh, people as closely bonded to Paul uh, and co-workers with him as anyone. And there is a house church. <clears throat> Wherever they go, they seem to be establishing <clears throat> small house communities. <clears throat> now, there is a kind of sense of ubiquity of Prisca and Aquila in the Pauline mission. So first, let's look at the book of Acts. And here is our map. There is Italy, there is Greece, and Corinth is in here. And uh, here is Asia Minor. Uh, so those are, that's the map. Uh, and now to the book of Acts. There, and we are in chapter 18, and and we read that there, and that there is Corinth, he found a, a, a Jew named Aquila, 
a native of Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. And for this we have secular confirmation because one of the great Roman historians says that in AD 49 all the Jews were expelled from Rome by the Emperor Claudius who is mentioned here, he was the emperor at that time, in AD 49 he expelled all the Jews from Rome because there had been some disturbance in relation to Crestus. And most people think that that reference is that there was some disturbance in the Jewish community over the meaning of Jesus. So over Christ, Crestus is Christ. That is not so important here. The point is, this is where they first meet, according to the book of Acts. They meet in Corinth and they become, you know, bonded with him. And then we read on in the same chapter in the book of Acts. After staying in Corinth, staying there, Corinth, for a considerable time, Paul said, said farewell to the believers and sailed for Syria accompanied by Priscilla, Priscilla and Aquila. So they are going with him. At Chancreae, he had his hair cut for he was under a vow. And Chancreae is the home church of Phoebe. So here you can sort of see the lay of the land, uh, as it were, and these relationships, how they are formed, and why the, we will show why they are so important. And then Paul in Acts 18, he leaves and Prisca and Aquila remain in Ephesus. So they, they stayed there, went, for, went to Syria. It turns out that they went to Ephesus here in that region. So Paul has left and he, and they meet someone by the name of Apollos. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and that is in Ephesus. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him, explained the way of God to him more accurately. So here are these fellow missionaries with Paul who are very competent people. They understand the message. They can do it on their own, as it were. And let's now look at the map. So they begin in Rome because they have been expelled from Rome and they show up here in Corinth. That's where Paul meets them. And they go with Paul together to Ephesus. So now they are uh, sort of traveling companions and co-workers and tent makers. That's the relations. They will eventually go back to Rome, uh, but we don't see that in the book of Acts. We see that <coughs> from the letters. So let's look now at the ubiquity that they are all over the place, also in the letters, in the witness of the letters. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the churches of Asia send greetings. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church at, in their house, greet you warmly in the Lord. So here is a letter written to Corinth from Ephesus. So, and Paul is here with Prisca and Aquila. And now to Romans. <laughs> Greet Prisca and Aquila who work with me in Christ Jesus and who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church in their house. <clears throat> so, so here Paul writes to them here, he greets, sends greetings from them. They are in the same place. Here they are no longer in the same place. And he sends a greetings to them. And then there is one from 2 Timothy that if we say that that is an authentic letter by Paul, Paul is now writing his last letter from prison and he says, greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. So <clears throat> let's look at the map. So here then there is a, <clears throat> so they meet, they came from Rome, they meet here in Corinth, they travel to Ephesus, they will eventually go back to Rome, and then if 
Paul wrote his last letter from Rome. He will greet Aquila and uh, Priscilla no longer in Rome. They are not in Rome. He is. And they are in Asia Minor. This is amazing stuff. Amazing travels. You kind of get respect for what these people are up to. It's quite, quite a commitment. It's sort of deep dyed, this mission they have and how bonded they seem to be and how fond of each other they also seem to be. <coughs> well, <coughs> let's look at the rest of the list. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who was my, the first convert in Asia for Christ. Paul's first convert in Asia, that's quite a memory. Greet Mary, <coughs> who has worked very hard among you. Greet Andronicus, Andronicus and Junia my relatives, and there is a question whether they are spiritual relatives, whether they are Jewish, or how he, what is in, uh, implied in that term. But they were in prison with me, so they have done some prison time together. They are prominent among the apostles, and one of them is a woman. And they were in Christ before I was. So the, this is a kind of network memories, relationships, a certain fondness for the others who are involved with him in this mission. And uh, these, by the way, these uh, iconic uh, 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 paintings are, uh, so there is a memory for them because these are the names of, here is Junia, by the way, uh, as one of the pe people who has been depicted in these uh, uh, iconic representations. <clears throat> so, greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. So here... <clears throat> We will summarize in a moment, but you see that there are all kinds of names. They don't mean that much to us. They're kind of uninteresting in some ways to us. We have sort of deleted them from the record. Most scholars who read Romans today, they read Romans chapter 1 to 8. And after that, they lose interest. Very few read chapter 16. We are beginning with chapter 16 because there is an ecological dimension, a relational dimension that actually has meaning for how we read this letter. We can't bypass it. And <clears throat> the last, a couple more. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> greet my relative Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. <laughs> greet the beloved Persis who has worked hard in the Lord. It's a long list, many names that are precious and important to Paul. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we go on. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and greet his mother, a mother to me also. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobas, Hermas, and the brothers and sisters who are with them. It's the shape of a house community. That's what it means. We get to see and read the member list of a house church in Romans, in Rome. <clears throat> Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. And <clears throat> I have ordered a book about these house churches, but I haven't read it yet. I will read it before I teach this course this fall at Loma Linda. But, <clears throat> but this is the lay of the land. One can deduct, one can sort of infer at least, at least uh, infer seven different house church communities in uh, Rome, maybe more, maybe seven, but at least five here. One with Prisca and Aquila, explicit, the letter says explicitly that they have a house church. And then you get the sense <clears throat> that these might be the other uh, uh, house uh, communities. And notice, there is a woman named in each of these churches. Here there are two, Mary and Junia. 
Here there is Julia and, Jul and Nereus and the sister of Nereus. Here there is Rufus and, her, and his mother. And here these two names, Tryphena and Tryphosa, are probably female names. So I know that this is beside the point, but I know that some people who have issues about women's role in the church, the role of women in, in the faith community, and who are reluctant to give a sort of unrestricted mandate to women, they should read Romans 16. Because Paul is often used as someone who sort of organized or sort of limited the use of women in the, in the faith communities. You cannot do that on the basis of Romans. On the basis of Romans, there is, <clears throat> seems to be equality and the role of Phoebe and of Prisca especially make women very prominent in the early mission uh, of uh, Jesus or, or the Jesus uh, <clears throat> movement. <clears throat> so, Romans happens within a web of prior relations. It does not arrive in a solitary parachute from on high. This is not a solo project, Paul operating alone. He is inside a community, in a, inside a web of relations. And then <clears throat> Romans has the longest list of friends, acquaintances, and fellow believers of any of Paul's letters. It is as though the church he would be expected to know the least is the one he knows best. He has not been to Rome yet, but chapter 16 shows that he has established a foothold, awareness of him, close relations, and, and the message that Paul preaches is not heard in Rome for the first time when the letter arrives because Prisca and Aquila are there from before and many others who have spent time with Paul. The tenor and texture of Romans is collegial, collaborative, and communal. That is very amazing. You could say we could represent it by this type of picture where Paul is in the center of, circle, of the circle, and yes, we're not going to say that he isn't the most important person in that fellowship, uh, that there is no need to say that. But we could say that this collegial, communal, collaborative project puts Paul as a person in the circle and not also just in the middle. See, because we want to, to uh, emphasize the relational part. So Paul, unlike many pastors in our time, and unlike many of us in our time, <clears throat> Paul is a team member and a team builder, and a good one at that too. To the growing list of titles beginning with Paul among, we must add Paul among friends among in that network. All right, <clears throat> we have looked at the human ecology, in uh, Romans, uh, and we started in chapter 16, looking at the ending. Uh, and sometimes it's a good idea to read the end first, because you might just learn something at the end that it is wise and useful to know when you start out from the beginning. So <clears throat> some people have talked, and one of my mentors have talked about the advantage of reading backwards. And sure enough, <clears throat> we are taking advantage of that. <clears throat> but <clears throat> we, yeah, so let me just uh, summarize here on, on the, what we have seen then. So here are three circles. I, three, three circles. There is an inner circle, and in that inner circle we have the Apostle Paul, we have Phoebe, Prisca, Aquila, and Junia, and many others in that inner circle. <clears throat> Those that's the primary community of Paul. That's the context of the letter. It's foundational ecology, you might say. And then around them, there are the readers of Paul, the readers of the letter, the readers of Romans. And we looked at some of them, uh, Origen, Augustine, John, uh, Luther, John Wesley. So in some ways, they make it harder for us to see that inner circle. We see 
Paul through the glasses of Paul's readers, especially Luther. So here is an outer circle, and here is a Richard Hayes and E.P. Sanders, and J. Christian Becker, who is deceased, and Paula Fredrickson. There are many others who deserve to be in that outer circle. I will say on behalf of those <coughs> people, the names on the outermost circle have helped retrieve lost meanings in Paul's letters. They are actually getting us back into the basic thing. Maybe even they don't do it as much as we need to do it. So <clears throat> I showed this uh, picture before here with Paul and his uh, and the primary uh, community and here with these uh, readers. And let me just try to uh, make a point here that <coughs> the most important reader of Romans, the most influential reader of Romans is, uh, is Luther. <coughs> and, and we tend to think that Luther has given us a normative uh, reading of Romans. But the first reader of Romans wasn't Martin Luther. The first reader of Romans was Phoebe, uh, who was <coughs> the one who carried the letter, we can assume, carried the letter to Rome and read it aloud in the Roman house churches. And how did she read it? How did she accent it? How did she maybe perform it? And as reader, she is also the first interpreter of Rome, of Romans. So these are things we will have to infer. Uh, but, you know, here as a major competitor now, or at, le at least a complementary <coughs> reader of Romans, we have Phoebe next to Martin Luther. We have a, you hadn't heard that before. Uh, <coughs> but, so reading now with ecological awareness, with awareness of these relationships, we can say that Paul wrote letters not Gospels. You can write a Gospel, and you can to some extent, even if you write a Gospel, Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, you can write it and think of a certain audience. But when you write a Gospel, the audience itself is not in the Gospel, as it were. When you write a letter, <coughs> the interaction between the writer and the audience is much closer and in some ways the situation of the audience is reflected in the letter. So Gospels, Paul wrote letters and the letters are situational and we have said that before, say it again, <coughs> and this I am indebted to Richard Hayes who has been my teacher and a friend and who has also written uh, a very uh, strong recommendation of my commentary on the book of Revelation. So he has uh, <coughs> had some confidence in, in my interpretations too, and I have a lot of confidence in what he has done on the letters of Paul. <coughs> so he says that there is an underlying narrative assumption in the letters that they assume some knowledge, some awareness, that there has been prior contact, that there was a prior story. In most of the letters Paul wrote, he had been himself to the churches. In, in 2 Thessalonians, Paul uh, says, don't you remember that I told you all these things in person? So then he repeats some of the things in the letter, but the letter is not the first contact. There is prior contact, there is a story uh, uh, from before. And uh, this is one of the points in this book, The Faith of Jesus Christ, rethinking the faith language in Paul uh, by, by uh, Professor Hayes. And let me just try to illustrate what that means. 
you can see that this is an iceberg. You're supposed to see that this is an iceberg. And icebergs, <coughs> most of the iceberg is below water and some of it is above water, maybe on a ratio of one to 10 or something like that. Most of it is underwater. Now, to use the iceberg as an illustration of <coughs> the relationship between the letter and the underlying narrative or the underlying prior na narrative, there is a big underlying prior narrative story, prior contact, and a letter as a kind of follow-up of that other story. But the letter will not spell out things because it assumes many things. And the original readers, they know those assumptions. And you and I, we only have the letter. We don't have that. We just have the letter. So we have to listen. And yes, we will be left to do some, to infer some things, but we cannot <coughs> read the letter and just be uh, sort of nihilistic about that prior narrative. We're going now to <coughs> the beginning of the letter. We are leaving behind the ending. And uh, here we start now in chapter one. And <clears throat> we read, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. <clears throat> so maybe I should have read this part first. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart. That's almost exactly how the prophet Jeremiah begins his book in the Old Testament. So Paul is in some ways, an apostle is almost like a prophet. There is a kind of sense of vocation, that Paul's vocation is a Jeremiah-like vocation. And then there is the scriptural uh, background. <clears throat> and here again, I will refer to, uh, to this book by uh, Richard Hayes that has been very, very well re received. It was written in the 1980s, Echoes of Scripture in the Letters of Paul, I think the 80s. <clears throat> and here Paul is also claiming continuity with the Old Testament, that he is not bringing a new religion to the world. He is not sort of inventing something. Whatever he says is anchored in the Old Testament, there is continuity. And we could also say that this is an ecological uh, thing because we have defined ecology as the science of relationships. So here we have relationships at the level of vocation and a relationship at the level of text, a prior text, a prior expectation in the Old Testament. Let's read on. <clears throat> the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God with power uh, according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> I call this retrieving materiality. I would have liked to have a whole presentation on that alone, but I have to contract a little here, uh, so I have put it uh, under here, but this is Caravaggio's uh, painting of the resurrection. The Jesus of Paul's, Paul's story is a human being, a flesh and blood human being. He is represented as God incarnate, God in a body, in a human body by his birth. So concerning his son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh. And then he is, remains a body, a person, a human being by resurrection. So incarnation, resurrection, and con continuity with the Old Testament is prominent. And it is all material because bodies have to have a space. They have to be in a certain place. They have to eat. They have to relate. So we do not have a disembodied Jesus. 
and we have uh, we have materiality and physicality here. <clears throat> and here is another one, and this one might be a little subtle, but we'll see if we can <clears throat> get it right. <clears throat> I have the headline here, Judaizing the Nations. So Paul says, through whom? Through Jesus. We have received grace and apostleship to bring about obedience grounded in God's faithfulness among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name. It's my translation. Including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. These are quite long, complicated sentences. It's quite dense, all of the stuff we have read here in the first six verses. And now to a comment by Paula Fredrickson, who is a, a, a person with a kind of Jewish sense of what Paul is doing. <clears throat> so here is from a, a, an article she wrote called Judaizing the Nations. From this historical fact that in, Me in Mediterranean antiquity, cult defined ethnicity and ethnicity defined cult. So you had various religions and each ethnic group has a certain religion and the identity, the ethnic identity of a group and the religious identity of a group are inseparable. That's what it means. So here she says, Augustine distilled theology, a Jewish Jesus, a Jewish Paul, and a Judaized first generation of Gentiles. Uh, served his defense of the doctrine of, of creation and incarnation. What are we seeing? We are seeing Paul traveling in the ancient world, a world where ethnicity and religion are the same. Uh, so the cult and the ethnicity are the same. And into that world he comes and tells people, you're going to change your cult. You're going to change your religion. He will sever the relationship between ethnicity and cult, ethnicity and religion, that is quite radical. He will Judaize them. He will tell them, you need to change your cult, your religion, and embrace the story, the God revealed in the Old Testament. She <coughs> embellishes on that in a number of books. I think she does it really, really well. I. I am, I, I, and she has such a, a kind of idiosyncratic, such a, an unusual language. She does it very, very effectively. Here is Paul, the pagan's apostle, and also Augustine and the Jews. These are wonderful books. <coughs> Listen to what she says. Ancient gods traveled in the blood. Ethnicity anchored piety. Let me stop there for a moment. It's ancient gods traveled in the blood, ethnicity anchored piety. That was true in the ancient world. It is still in some ways true. In Norway, most people used to be Lutherans. We had a state church and a Norwegian identity and a Lutheran identity was quite, quite a bit the same. In Italy, everyone used to be a Roman Catholic and a Italian identity and Catholic was two sides of the same coin. In Greece, Orthodox. So you are Greek and you are Orthodox. In Saudi Arabia, you're Muslim. There is a sense of ethnicity and religion together still today. In the deep south in the US, you have a certain coherence also, that a sort of regional, regional identity that is also religious. <clears throat> Let's leave that aside. Let's go back to Paula Fredrickson. Ancient gods traveled in the blood. Ethnicity anchored piety. To make a commitment to a foreign god to the point of forsaking the gods of one's own people, a condition unique to Judaism in the pre-Christian period, was to behave with alarming and insulting disloyalty. So here, it's not that this isn't radical, this is really radical because you are sort of tinkering with 
a person's most profound sense of identity. You are sort of undoing, deconstructing identities here to make these people believers in the God that revealed himself in the Old Testament. <clears throat> so the, it's said that Paul is preaching in the Gentile world a law-free gospel. And Paula Fredrickson says he is doing no such thing. It's a myth that Paul has a sort of law-free mission. So <clears throat> he, she says, unlike Augustine, I will conclude my reconstruction of Paul's mission and message by urging that a whole host of theologically imbued concepts and vocabulary, and especially the phrase law-free mission, be dropped by scholars who quest for the historical Paul. Why is that? We are going to summarize <coughs> and see how this adds up. <coughs> so, retrieving ecology, human and otherwise, and now reading verse 7 in the, uh, the, the first seven verses is sort of the introduction of the letter, and now we are doing verse 7. To all God's beloved in Rome, who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> just want to highlight the Rome part here, because many old manuscripts, remember we do not have the original letter, we have copies. In many of the copies made quite early on, the in Rome part was dropped. So you read to all God's beloved without seeing Rome. And this is in verse 7 and in verse 15, 115, the same thing, that those who copied thought, well, let's leave Rome out. Let's make it more general. Let's decontextualize it and say that this is a letter written to whom it may concern, which it also is in a way. But now textual critics are very sure that that is some copy error, some well-intentioned copy error, but they should not have done it. The letter was written to Rome, and this is part of retrieving the ecological texture of the letter. So now to some <coughs> summary statements. In the ecosystem, the textual ecosystem of Romans, we have a web of close personal relationships tight links to the Old Testament, a messenger who is called like Jeremiah, that's Paul, and we have an embodiment, we have body, we have Jesus as the sort of focal image, and he is embodied. That is the beginning <coughs> of the letter. And then, <coughs> Paula Fredrickson, Paul is Judaizing the Gentiles they will henceforth become obedient to the first of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. That is, so is it a law-free mission? It isn't, because that is the basic, that is the sort of cornerstone of, of the mission. <clears throat> and then, uh, uh, yes, let me stand here. Uh, and then uh, the letter opening <clears throat> brings to view materiality and physicality, incarnation and resurrection, and a city in Italy. It is a letter to all God's beloved in Rome. And we restore that to the text, and we're off to a promising start.